Hello, today is November 30th, 2006. We're at the home of Mr. Gil Wilson at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Fort Col or Northern Colorado Oral History Project. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. And then thank you for participating in this program. You bet, Brad. Let's start out if we can. If you can give us a little bit of background about yourself, uh, could you tell us when and where you were born? Yeah, so I was born in Los Angeles, California, in uh, April of 1922, and actually was involved in a, uh, a vocational high school there that uh, taught photography three hours a day, where you actually did uh, work, and then the fourth hour was what you call the related or academic side of photography. And interestingly, the, uh, the professor or the teacher that we had there had gone to uh, UCLA with my father in this uh, Smith Hughes vocational training program. But I had an interest in photography back in uh, about the eighth grade. I'd seen an ad in a, um, in a Sunday paper on a camera and matter of fact, it was called a Uniflex, I believe, kind of a Bakelite little thing and just cost a dollar or something. And after I took my first roll of pictures, I asked my dad if he could process it and he had it done and then he could see I had an interest in photography. Now, was he a photographer himself? No, he was a art teacher at a local junior high school at that time. And, um, but he did all the photography uh, for the annual at that school. And um, so after he could understand that this was a field I was interested in, he arranged to, with another teacher from another school that had a photo studio. And I was able to work their summers learning the basics of photography. Uh, there was no pay involved, but it was a great opportunity to learn something. And so this basically, uh, after getting out of high school, I went to work for Eastman Kodak Company in Hollywood. And I worked in their color lab there for a year, just a uh, matter of fact, when the war broke out. And so photography was my background. And in high school, I earned my money by uh, doing freelance work for the Los Angeles papers. I covered the sporting events. And uh, we could always sell our pictures. And depending on where it was placed in the paper was how much money we got. Huh. If it made the front page, you made pretty good money there, $25 then, which was a lot of money. And uh, so I was able to buy a car and, and, of course, have professional equipment, which I did throughout that time. Do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Yes, actually, um, I can remember I was in the back seat of... Uh, uh, this Studebaker champion that my dad had just recently purchased a couple months before. And so my mother and dad were in the front seat and we were going out North Figueroa in Los Angeles through the Figueroa tunnels. And uh, we heard this news flash come in and then we'd go into the tunnels. Of course, you couldn't hear, it was cut off. And so it was really disturbing to all of us because we, uh, well, actually my, one of my brothers was stationed at Hickam Field and uh, so, obviously this was a, a concern for them more than me, but, but uh, we did get through there and continued on to visit some relatives that lived in Pasadena, California. So that was my initial uh, uh, hearing of what had happened there. It was, you know, just 18 years old at the time and couldn't quite understand the full impact of it yet. But. So that's uh, how that's long. How long uh, was it before they found out uh, you got word on uh, on, your, on your brother yeah. and what uh, his conditions were? Well, it was a while before because they obviously, you know, they were uh, went into a whole different mode there, and, and uh, communications were pretty much censored. And it was a while before we did get uh, a letter stating that he had survived the thing and everything. So that, uh, and then, matter of fact, he was. Uh, he was an enlisted man at that time, and he was immediately given a, a, a direct commission as an officer at that point, yes. Mm. How much, uh, from that point on then, how much 
time passed before you entered the service? Well, I went in on February 16th, 1942, so not too many months there, just a couple of them. Did you uh, enroll or did you no, I, I, uh, I volunteered, I just went down and signed up, and I remember I had another brother had to drive me down to Fort MacArthur, uh, California, which was uh, maybe about 25 miles away from where we lived, and, and uh, of course everything was in a war mode there. And I can remember being a little bit odd uh, because I used to see the um, the fort, you know, as I was growing up. But we were never allowed on the on the base. But so now here I was entering the gate and going in there. So it was uh, kind of an interesting situation at that time. And I remember taking a whole battery of testing and and getting all the shots, you know, some lines you went through, you'd get shot in both arms at the same time even. But uh, after a period of time, then all that was finished and they sent me to uh, basic training out in uh, East Texas at, I believe, Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, how did you come to choose the, uh, the Army versus other uh, branches? Well, actually, I had an opportunity. Um, we had an interesting situation with our, our teacher at high school. He, he was... Uh, had a kind of a attitude of a family organization that everybody stayed in contact with everyone because his feeling was you never knew when that some other member of the photo class would be able to either uh, be aware of a job and could get you a job or she said you'd always get one good opportunity in life and you want to know about it and take advantage of it but so uh, they had um, the Navy had come to them and had um, good positions available immediately, depending on your experience, and um, they had offered me a uh, petty officer rating if I'd go in the Navy. But in my earlier days, I used to fish a lot there in Los Angeles or on the beaches there, and I had some bad experiences out on the barges getting seasick, and I figured, if you go in the Navy, you're going to be out to sea, you know, without realizing there were other things. So I did turn that down, and the only other thing, of course, was uh, the Army. So that's where I wound up. So you're off to uh, Wichita Falls for basic? Yeah, we, we went by train, and I remember seeing my uh, getting out there somewhere in Texas. Uh, there was snow all over the ground, and, and uh, even though I'd seen a little bit of it up in the mountains in Los Angeles as a kid, but this was my first time to really be in it. And, um, so I did go through the basic training, and then they sent me on out to a couple hundred miles west there to Lubbock, Texas, which was a twin-engine airfield. And uh, of course, obviously then I was in what was called the Army Air Corps. and um, The predecessor to the United States Air Force. Right. Okay. And so they had me uh, pegged to be a, an, an AM, an aircraft mechanic. And I guess uh, through all the paperwork I'd filled out with my background strictly in photography didn't mean anything at that point. So I was walking to my first day to, to report to the uh, training and walking uh, down the road on the way there I noticed a uh, sign said photo section. And so I made a detour and went in there and talked to the lieutenant in charge and and I uh, told him my background and uh, asked him what the story was on the photo section and he says, well, I can really use you here. He says, I'm, I'm the officer in charge, but I don't know anything about photography. And um, so I went on to my class and then that next day I was transferred into the photo lab, and, um, which uh, was interesting, you know, doing doing work and then he had a lot of other people in there that uh, basically most of them knew nothing about photography so uh, immediately I was teaching them how to do the processing in the lab and how to run the cameras. They had good equipment, professional camera speed graphics. And so I stayed in there, I uh, can't remember the exact period of time, but I remember I had an assignment to go out the airstrip. We had a general flying in from Washington, D.C. to do an inspection. And so I was out there and uh, shooting the general, getting off the plane and, and uh, viewing the troops and that sort of thing. 
and I noticed a photographer was with him, had come from Washington, D.C. And uh, I got closer to him and I realized that he had gone to the same high school and the same photo class, except he was two years ahead of me. So I didn't know him real well, but yeah, he kind of knew me. And so we got into a conversation and, and he says, you know, there's a uh, motion picture unit being formed out in Hollywood. He says, uh, you, you know, would you consider maybe going out there if it could be worked out? And I said, well, certainly that'd be nice to go back home, you know. And uh, it was a matter of less than 30 days and orders came through and uh, sending me out there, transferred me there. And, and it was a Hal Roach Studios. And they were um, set up to do training films for the, uh, for the now Army Air Corps and also some of the Army deals. And with my background in still photography, they made assignments for me and sent me around the country doing uh, stories at various air bases. And uh, matter of fact, my, my uh, photos that I took in the stories wound up in Flying Magazine. And uh, that's a magazine that's still being published today. So it survived all those years. But then one day, I just come back, I think it was from Luke Field in Arizona, and talking to somebody, he said, you know, there's a, an outfit we're hearing rumors about that might be going to China. And um, there, you know, to be a photographic deal, and that was the end of the conversation, and I got to thinking about it, gee, that'd be something, you know, go to China, the other side of the world. And so then I went in and asked permission to, to speak to the adjutant of the base, and that turned out to be Ronald Reagan. Uh, who, of course, later became president. But at that time, he was a captain. And so I went in and reported to uh, Captain Reagan and, and said, you know, I heard rumors that there might be a, a small unit going over to China, and I'd sure like to be involved if that's the case. And he says, well, what do you know about photography? And so I gave him my background and said, well, you're well, well qualified, but he says, you know, young man, he says, you've really got a nice situation here. you got a, a bunk here on Soundstage 5, and your parents just live a couple miles down the road, and, and you get to see them weekends when you're in town. And he says, you know, you, you could probably spend the war right here. You think you'd really want to really ship out? And, and I said, oh, yeah. And he says, well, now, of course, this is still a rumor, but he says, why don't you talk to your parents this weekend and then come back? Monday and let me know what they think. If, if they approve of this in their minds, well, I'll, I'll see if there's any truth to this. So, of course, I went home that weekend, came back Monday morning. I'd never discussed anything with my parents. I wasn't about to do that. But I had two older brothers that were already in the service and overseas. Do you suspect you would have got resistance from your from your parents uh, because of that fact? Yeah, I, I'm sure they would have said that's enough for the family. You just stay here. So, and I reported to, to Captain Reagan and, and said, "Oh gosh, yeah, my family is delighted. You know, they think that'd be a great thing for me." And so I deceived the president, future president of the United States, flat out lied to him. And so again, in a matter of just a short period of time, uh, I got. Orders. We were still on the base, they were being formed, and it was a small unit, seven officers, 21 enlisted men, and uh, the CO of the uh, outfit actually uh, was a cinematographer that uh, did work uh, on Gone with the Wind, so he was an experienced man. And then other than, than that gentleman, uh, one other officer was a, uh, a grip on the studio, so he knew nothing about photography, really. But And then, um, so I was the only enlisted man that actually had a background in photography. So they immediately put me to work teaching everybody how to run cameras, how to hold them, how to put the film in the, in, you know, in the slides and what have you. And then plus, uh, I had had, going way back my first year in high school, I'd gone to a civilian military training corps CMTC, which was a four-year program. I only attended it one year for 30 days. So I knew basic training. So they had me teaching the, the uh, basic training also, you know, 
close order drill and that sort of stuff. Is it something similar to today's ROTC yeah, just program? Like, like you'd normally get in, in, in your uh, basic training program. Uh -huh. okay. but to keep, keep, actually everybody had nothing to do at this point where all, all the equipment was being put together and, and uh, so I can remember there was a, a, a stunt pilot called Paul Matz and uh, so he took me up to uh, learn how to do aerial photography and um, that was an interesting experience because I hadn't really flown before huh. and, and taking pictures out of an open cockpit so that was an interesting episode there but then finally the orders did come through to uh, we we're shipping out so we went um, up to uh, Camp Stoneman in um, in the Bay Area around San Francisco area there and um, Eventually, we boarded ship, and it was the USS Brazil was the uh, name of the, it was a converted passenger liner. And we were 45 days at sea going to Australia, but zigzagging all the way, and that's why it took so long. And um, how, how was the passage over for you? Uh, well, actually, I'd say about the time we went under the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, I was beginning to get seasick again, and um, so I wound up, our bunks were all course down below decks, you know, I think we were about the sixth level down, and hot and, and just smelly and everything, it was terrible, and somebody realized that, that I wasn't getting up to eat, you know, and so they put me up, up in the hospital bay there for a day, and I got my sea legs rather quickly and they let me, gave me a pass to go out on deck and, and all of a sudden I, you know, got used to the ocean. And um, so in the interim, um, there were some other members of our, our unit which was called the 16th CCU, which was the 16th Combat Camera Unit. And we were going to be attached to the 14th Air Force, uh, which was General Chenault's flying tigers in China, <coughs> excuse me. So somehow um, the information got out that uh, some of the ship's crew and officers would like to know more about what was happening on the war. And so um, we went into the radio operator and sure he got all the information currently on the war. And I, I had, um, was actually an expert typist. I'd learned typing in high school. So uh, he'd get these reports off the radio and uh, I'd type them up and, and we put them on what was called a mimeograph sheet. And we ran out mimeograph sheets for the, uh, the, the, the ship's officers. And uh, in taking, I think it was the first or second day, we took the reports in to the the ship's mess for the uh, for the officers now, and so they were so excited about getting this daily information, they started giving us uh, meals, and these meals, of course, were pretty nice compared to what was being dished out down below. So there was about five of us there, and we'd get these five five meals once a day, and in order to to um, get this little newspaper put together and everything, they gave us, uh, they had some uh, nurses quarters and there were no nurses aboard ship and this was an air conditioned area and so there's where we slept and everything under great conditions and had one outstanding meal a day. <laughs> so we're fortunate there in that situation. Then we did land, uh, we went into Tasmania, Hobart, Tasmania. Landed there, and we were allowed to go off. Uh, I think we were allowed two days, and so um, about four of us went into a hotel, got a hotel room, and uh, I remember uh, this big thing about this: it had a huge bathtub. It was so oversized, you could actually just lay out prone in it. So. We all took our turns getting in fresh water bass instead of the salt water, and, and it was so delightful. I remember we just did one bath and just turn around, empty the tub, and put hot water back in it again. So then we went down to eat, 
And uh, being in that area, lamb was a big dish in, in that area and happened to be a favorite of mine. So I remember the cost was something like 75 cents for a tremendous lamb dinner. And uh, got through and it was so good, turned around and ordered another one. So he ate two of those in a row. And then eventually, of course, we wound up back aboard ship because we had to, had to, it was to Cal, Calcutta, I believe, the west coast. Can't remember which is west and which is east there. But we then uh, went on narrow gauge across to India to Bombay. <clears throat> and then... Uh, what was that trip like? Yeah. That was a, not a very good experience. Um, you'd pull in at night to a station, spend the night, and then in the morning um, the area would be littered with dead bodies. The Indians were, uh, the East Indians, were starving. And um, they were just, I guess, a tremendous shortage of food. And of course, you know, we all tried to give them some of our rations, but uh, our rations had meat in them, and they were strictly vegetarian, so they wouldn't touch anything. They'd starve instead, which they did. So that episode uh, went on for a couple of nights as we went on across, and it repeated. At night you'd pull in, and it was just the, the uh, citizens were all over the, the area there, you know, and, and laying down and sleeping. And, like I say, a lot of them never got up in the morning. But one interesting episode I can remember, we stopped, uh, the train would stop at meal time, and they set up a chow line, and we're going through the chow line with our mess kits, and one of the fellas, uh, another one about our age uh, from uh, Massachusetts, I believe, and he had just gone through the mess line, had his mess kit filled with food, was walking down the tracks to find a place to sit and eat, all of a sudden, here comes a huge buzzard, flies in over his shoulder, grabs the food out of his tray, and off it goes. And of course, he's mad and throws his tray down and everything. But uh, that was just one of the interesting episodes in that going across. But when we did uh, get to the east coast of, uh, of India, we did then get aboard a uh, river boat and went up the Brahmaputra River. And on that trip, we could see what was called the burning ghats. And this is where they would uh, take their um, deceased and they would uh, stack wood around them and burn them. And of course, we didn't know immediately what that was, but somebody aboard that ship, a crew member, told us what it was all about. So that was interesting. And then also to see the, um, the Indians out there bathing along the shorelines and the Brahma future was was uh, very dark, you know, from the runoff. Anything but clean water, but yet they were out there bathing. But we did finally wind up in the northern part of India and in preparation to uh, fly on in over the hump, the Himalayas, into, into China, Kunming, China. And um, so they they had us waiting there for a few days because of making sure uh, where the Japanese were with their zeros. At that time, they were still coming in and uh, raising havoc, actually, with the cargo planes flying over the Himalayas. But eventually, we did um, did make it on over into Kunming and uh, was based out of that for virtually two years. And so while there, I did fly uh, my combat missions and did uh, went out with the Chinese ground troops. And uh, what so was the whole purpose of your unit to document the war? Document this point the war, the and uh, mainly with the flying tigers. But like I say, we did do some ground stuff, and I did a, a film there called Little Tiger Joe. And the storyline on that was uh, a down crew in uh, eastern China that this uh, young kid, about eight or nine years old, and was dubbed Little Tiger Joe, uh, led them in back into uh, you know American hands. And so uh, it was an interesting story, and I did all the photography on that. And that later was shown uh, around in the United States. I, I don't know where it wound up, but uh, 
I did wind up flying 25 missions. I had uh, a little over 100 hours, so I was actually when you hit 25, your 25th mission, if you survive, you were then eligible to, to be rotated back to the States. And um, but prior to that, uh, we had uh, in we had both twin engine Mitchells and four engine B24s. It was necessary to go back to India to load up for picking up our 500,000 pound bombs and also fuel. And so I decided to go back on one of these flights. There was five of us B24s flew in, and before we. Um, actually landed there in India and you could pick up this fragrance which turned out to be sandalwood and it was really dense and of course the humidity is very dense there in India. But anyhow we loaded up our bombs and uh, took off again and then we uh, proceeding over the Himalayas and hit a storm and uh, went into some tremendous downdrafts and uh, they were estimating them to be like 1500 foot drops. Mm. And of course, there was communications going in between the planes. And uh, the bottom line is when we landed at Kunming, there was only two of us that made it back. The other three went down from the uh, damages to their wings and everything, you know. And of course, I got air sick up there because of those tremendous downdrafts. And we were on oxygen, so I can remember I have to take my uh, oxygen mask off to throw up. You know, I couldn't do that in the mask. I can remember the whole front of my flight suit was just frozen from the irping, but um, still and all, we're so thankful that we made it through. But that was as bad as, as a lot of the combat missions. That was terrible. But on my 25th mission, we went out in the afternoon on a B-25 to do uh, low level on a bridge. And uh, which we succeeded in taking out, but we hit a lot of ground fire, tremendous amount, and then was jumped by one zero. And uh, I don't know whether it was from the ground fire or the zero, but a 20 millimeter, the pilot estimated it was, uh, took out a couple engines on the, uh, a couple cylinders on the port engine. So that uh, when we were pulling up to to leave the area, of course, we're not going as fast. So the other planes took off and left us. And we struggled back, and, and by that time it was dark. And the pilot uh, found, since found out the navigational equipment was out from the, you know, the uh, ground fire we'd got. And the radio we figured was out because he couldn't get any contact. And uh, so he indicated, he said, I'm, I'm heading this thing to where I think our airfield is, but I have no way of knowing. So he was flying by the seat of his pants. As it turned out, he did a great job. He flew actually very close to our airfield. And um, not knowing that it was our airfield though, because he, he says, we don't know whether we're flying over enemy territory or friendly, just don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, the policy there at, at Kunming was uh, they had a P-38 they would send up if anything came in at night that was not identifiable and they'd shoot at it. Well, so the P-38 comes up, which we didn't know it was that at the time, the shot, but fortunately it didn't hit us. And um, so then we're going along further and, and he says, better get ready. He says, I know we're going to run out of fuel. And he says, we're at 13, 14,000 foot is what I'm estimating elevation. And uh, again, I don't know because of what fired on us, whether we're in enemy area or not. And so finally the word come out, you're going to have to bail. The plane's going down. And so I released the, the hatch. I was in the aft end. And uh, the radio operator was doing May days all the time and getting no response. So he turns around, I had my chest pack on and, and um, so I'm getting ready to jump and he just shoves me back. He went out first and uh, so then. Yeah, had you ever jumped from a I had never jumped, to... but uh, all of a sudden, the training that I'd received two years earlier back on the States on how to go out of a plane comes back to me. I never thought about it, if, you know, in this interim. So I tumbled out head first, and of 
course it's pitch black. And um, so I did a, fortunately, a fast count to 10. And I remember swinging once or twice was about all. And then I smacked into something. And um, that something turned out to be the side of a mountaintop, oh, wow. which was rocky and, you know, and it knocked me out. I tore up my leg and uh, found that out the next morning, you know, that it bleeding pretty badly and my head was goofy. And I don't know how long I was unconscious, but uh, I can remember when I did come around, the first thing I did was uh, I said, I said the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> and uh, I uh, followed that up with a prayer my, my mother had taught me when I was a kid, and it, was, it starts out, Shepherd, show me how to go, I can remember that, but anyhow, I finally gathered my senses and my, my, uh, put my stuff together, kind of put the parachute under some branches or something. I don't really remember what it was. and Decided I'm going to start walking around to see if I can find out anything. So I took off in the, at night there and eventually came back and tripped over my parachute. So I realized I was just going around the top of the mountain. Huh. <clears throat> so I just stayed there then. I covered up with a parachute till daybreak. Then with, uh, took my parachute and um, took off again, this time hoping I'd see something. There was no trails or anything, but I'm starting around again the mountain, and this time I'm hearing a faint cry for help. And uh, so I cautiously went a little closer to it, and, and then I could tell it was this other airman, Stubby his name was, and he was uh, taking, uh, it was his first time out on a mission, and he had a camera up front, and so I hollered at him, uh, you know, asked is that, you know, is this stubby? And he says, oh yeah, and he said, but I can't get up. And he says, I'm in bad shape. And I was concerned, I didn't know whether they were using him, maybe the Japanese perhaps to lure me in. But I could tell he really was in pain, so I finally made my way in. And he uh, had his chute and harness, everything still stuck on on top of him. And, and couldn't move, and um, so I got the stuff off of him and could tell that uh, his leg was contorted and we figured he had a broken leg up toward the hip area. Mm -hmm. So I got uh, morphine out of my pack and we carried escape packs with us on these missions and I shot him up which took effect rather quickly and, and um, then got his morphine out of his and uh, left it with him and you know I said I'm gonna have to go get you some help because I can't move you. And he agreed and so I said let me take your 45 and just stick it out past the reach of your hand and um, in case I don't get back too soon and the morphine wears off you know, I don't want you shooting yourself. And uh, he agreed and I said then if it Turns out Japanese come in on you, you can make that effort to get that 45 to help. So I took off and started down a, the mountainside. And then I did see this farmer working. As I got closer, you know, I couldn't determine whether he was into me or not. So I finally hollered out in what little Chinese I knew. And it turned out he was Chinese and um, made the, the exchange that it was friendly. And so then I approached him and uh, between our conversations, he said, there's a big road, big road down the hill and um, there'd be American trucks, Megwa trucks. And so I went on down there, it turned out to be the Burma Road. And um, so I'm there waiting, you know, there's no traffic on it, but uh, eventually I see this big six by six truck coming down the road. So I get out in the road and pull it down, you know, and it stops and there's two guys in there, two GIs, and they really didn't listen to me too much. They were talking about this big bomb that had just dropped in Japan, and he said, the war's going to be over real soon, and they just couldn't understand, and I said, look, I need help. I got a 
another airman up on the mountain back there. And they said, well, there's nothing around here. When we get to some base, we'll, we'll call. And so they just put it in gear and took off. And I, I was tempted to shoot at them, the truck, you know, I was so angry. But for some reason, I didn't. And uh, then before time, here comes a little Jeep down the road. And I hailed it down. And it was a signal for a Jeep and had a list of men driving and an officer riding. And of course, uh, he understood the situation as I explained it real quick. So he said, well, look, we passed a pumping station uh, a few miles back up the road. I'll turn around, we'll go back there and get you some help. And I said, okay, I'll go back up the top and I'll um, get some wood together. And if I, you know, hear an airplane, I'll start a little fire so they'll know where I am. Well, he was uh, bright enough to figure out our coordinates where we were. And uh, it wasn't too terribly long, as I recall, then I heard a plane coming overhead that turned out to be a helicopter. Huh. And I was surprised because I'd never seen a helicopter in China before. And so they, you know, they got my smoke fire going. They dropped me a note and said, we're low on fuel. We're, we're heading to that, that uh, station, pumping station. Refuel and we'll be back and to clear a field. So I went back down the hill, got this farmer, he got a couple more people, came back up, we cleared an area out. And um, then it gets dark and no planes coming back. And uh, pretty soon it starts to rain. I remember putting my parachute up, rigging it up to, to keep my buddy, you know, dry. And um, it was late at night, finally heard this noise coming up the hill and through an exchange we realized that, you know, it was Americans coming up. It turned out to be the flight surgeon, the pilot, and a couple of crew members. And uh, they were able to find us and of course he went right to work on Stubby and, uh, and relieved this tension on his leg and put it in traction. And then the next morning, we headed on down the mountainside, and there was a, they had an ambulance waiting down there on the Burma Road for him. So he was able to take off and was on his way back to help. And it was about, uh, I was left on my own, so actually I had to figure out which way to go, and there's no room for me in the ambulance. So anyway, I hitchhiked and got rides and got into one airstrip and then finally caught a plane. And when I was on this airstrip, they told me, well, you know, the headquarters that you used to be in in Kunming moved. And they're up in Chongqing, China, the northern part. And this just happened. So I wound up eventually in Chongqing. And sure enough, that there was our 14th Air Force headquarters. And, uh, you know, what had happened to the rest of the crew on that? Uh, no, never ran into any of them. And uh, I got a feeling they, um, they probably were processed and sent home immediately, you know. And um, I was only there a couple of days, and of course uh, the uh, the acting commander of our uh, of our outfit was uh, Major Penny Baker, and he had worked at Warner Brothers during the war, and a real bright man, very intelligent, and he kind of took over for the CEO because of. As it turned out, the, uh, the original CEO who stayed with the outfit uh, was an alcoholic. And we never saw him once when we hit China. Never saw him one time. He just stayed in his, in his uh, room. So anyhow, Major Pennybaker said, well, we've we got to get you a silver star for your rescue. With what you did there, you know, the fact that you didn't know you were behind enemy lines or whatever, and you did everything right. And, and he says, we'll get the orders going. And in the meantime, the point system come out because the war, you know, did end with the, with the drop of that bomb on August 5th. And um, I had more than double the amount of points to go home, plus the fact that it was my 25th mission and what I'd gone through. So immediately I was sent down to India and caught a flight and went around, uh, I remember, through Africa and came back and landed in Florida. But... Um, as far as the recommendation for the Silver Star was concerned, uh, 
turned out that the outfit packed up and left just a few days after me, so when I saw Penny Baker back in the uh, States, you know, you know, I asked him if anything ever happened. He said, you know, nothing ever got done because uh, we left rather hurriedly. And so I didn't think any more about it. That was it. And then, um, so then to continue the storyline there, I, uh, when we went, to, landed in Florida, took a, uh, got on a troop train, went by train back to Los Angeles. Oh, geez. And, um, of course, was uh, was able to get out. You know, right away I decided I didn't want to stay in because they gave you that option. So I visited my teacher back at high school, and uh, you know, let him know I was back. Just talk to him and visit, and, and so he, he says, you know, um, a graduate from here, um, a couple of years behind you. Uh, she was in and told me that there might be an opening um, out on Sunset Strip at a magazine out there because they hired a photographer away and, uh, and she worked for Photoplay magazine. And he said, if you're interested, I'll set up a deal so you can find out about it. So sure, I'm interested. So in effect, um, I had a blind date. So I can remember going into this... Uh, restaurant and bar in, um, in Los Angeles and um, I remember there's the photo teacher at the bar and here's this real <laughs> vivacious redhead. <laughs> so the interesting thing is we had a drink but she, she doesn't like alcohol but uh, <laughs> she was at the bar so one thing led to another, and she told me the information, and I went out and interviewed and got, got a job immediately. And uh, so I dated her. And <laughs> eventually she's my wife. <clears throat> so we, excuse my emotions here, but as I look back at it, but uh, yeah, we've been married 60 years. <clears throat> and uh, in the interim, of course, had four sons. But anyhow, so I, I went to work for this um, magazine and eventually, uh, because of my background, I became chief photographer for uh, uh, three other magazines. It was Ideal Publishing Company out of New York and it was movies. Movie Life and Movie Stars Parade, three magazines. So I've stayed there, I think, about a year or so. And um, I was a product, of course, of the Depression growing up in the 30s. And I became a little apprehensive that, that we were heading into another Depression. And so I abandoned ship and uh, joined the police department in Los Angeles and went through their training program and uh, went through the basic things, walking a beat and what have you. And when they found out my background, they eventually made me a detective in the crime lab. And of course did photographic work there too. So um, as time went on, uh, family's getting bigger and I need more money. So I had a brother-in-law with the Rexall Drug Company and, and uh, he said, well, you ought to go to work here. And the guy, probably twice what you're earning now. And I knew nothing about the drug stores. But he set it up for me to um, go into a training program. I remember I got 75 cents an hour working in a, a drug store in Pasadena, which uh, was right on the parade route where the uh, Rose Bowl parade always came by. So anyhow, I worked there. And then when an opening came on Rexall, they hired me, and I worked uh, up in the Bay Area, I had a territory there, and then um, they pulled me into headquarters and um, wanted me to head up one of their departments, and then they said, I did that for a short time, and then they said that they, they're going to abandon this department, so uh, we want you to go to work with some chain stores. You can either go to Arizona or Colorado. So 
well, I've been to Arizona many times, but never in Colorado, so I, I'll go to Colorado. And so I did work there with a, a chain store, the Bubble Drug Company out of uh, Denver. And as time went on there, the, um, the owner was getting up in years and he sold the chain. And uh, unbeknownst to me, he set it up for me to uh, have the opportunity to get a drugstore in Fort Collins. And um, so I'm walking down the hallway, I remember, and this attorney from the company that's buying the, the chain said, Wilson, he says, what do you want to do with your drugstore? I said, what drugstore? He said, well, the one that they're giving you. And uh, I said, where's that? He said, well, in Fort Collins. You want it or not? And I said, well, I guess so. Never, never uh, thought any more about it. And so he brings me in and outlines everything. And so I come up to Fort Collins and look at this drugstore. It was uh, out near the campus out there, Elizabeth and Shields. And I um, said, well, I need some money, you know, to buy this thing. We said, well, all you need is enough money for the inventory and fixtures. There's no blue sky involved and it's yours. So I walked into the bank. First National Bank in Fort Collins and met the president, was Tom Gleason, and uh, explained my situation. And I said, now, I, of course, I've got stock in the company that I've accumulated. And, and uh, he said, how much money do you need? And I told him what it was. And he said, you've got it. Reached across the deck, shook my hands, and it's the end of the deal. <clears throat> so I had a drugstore there for several years, and um, one day a friend of mine, a real estate broker, walked in and, and said that, um, you know, I got this client from Los Angeles, and he wants to buy a drugstore here. He said, would you sell yours? And I said, I never thought about it. And so he says, well, come up with a price. And so I told him the next day, I gave him a price, got it an outlandish price, figured that would never work out. He calls me back and he says, he wants your store. And so I wound up selling it, but uh, in the interim, uh, my wife and I had started other stores. We had uh, actually three gift stores, and she ran that, one of them which was up in Laramie, Wyoming, and the other two in Fort Collins. But through all this time, somehow something worked out. I got a notice that they, um, they were giving me a bronze star for the uh, rescue of this other airman, which I did get. So I did wind up with an air medal, a purple heart, and a bronze star, plus a variety of campaign medals there throughout uh, time in India and China and so forth. But um, so that basically brings me up to the time when, uh, when I got out of the drugstore, I had to uh, figure something else to do. So I did get involved in selling real estate, I guess like a lot of people do. I specialized in businesses. And then um, I got to, one of my friends came out from, um, from uh, Los Angeles area. And um, he was involved in doing some work at the Denver Zoo and an interesting process and everything. And, and uh, he says, you know, you ought to get involved in this do this work, we got more than we can handle. So one thing led to another. Uh, we learned how to make artificial rock and what have you. And, and so over a five year span, we did all the work for the Denver Zoo exhibits. And then in a real elaborate one out in Las Vegas for somebody where we put in a huge swimming pool and waterfalls and what have you. And um, did work down in um, in Texas for zoos down there, and then retired from that episode, sold it actually to a, a national, international company. And uh, at my age, I didn't want to expand and do more, but so they took over my business. And, and that, that was uh, pretty much the size of it here and, until uh, currently today. That's right. Um, well, let me back up. Just ask a few questions. Sure. Uh, particularly when you, after you crashed, you said you were injured. Were you able to? How, how badly? Obviously, it sounded like well, the, the leg was, of course, bleeding quite a bit. Ripped it open pretty good, and um, and 
And then I, when I bailed out, I, I had this uh, British chest pack on, and when I was going down head first, hadn't righted myself yet, and I pulled the ring on that, and that uh, being on the chest popped up, and the shroud lines really uh, burnt all the underside of my uh, chin, made it raw in there. And uh, which I didn't know at the time, of course, other than I knew there was some pain there. And, and, and the next thing I knew, it hit this mountainside. Oh. And uh, of course, it was immediately not goofy. And I should say, I have no idea how long I was unconscious, yeah. but um, it took a while to regain my thoughts when I did uh, regain consciousness, said my prayers, and asked for help, you know, uh, through the Lord. And um, then that, that experience of going around the top of the mountain and coming back to the same spot, and that's when I decided I needed to just uh, stay there and be light. What, uh, can you, you remember what you were thinking or explain your thoughts uh, to people, particularly like me, that couldn't even imagine what it's like to be under fire in an airplane and, and getting communications back from the pilot that they're lost and you're gonna, you're gonna go down and you're gonna have to jump. Do you remember what you were thinking through that well, whole? Well, actually it's surprising, you know, you don't, uh, you know, there's an element of anxiety, but not uh, great fear didn't take over, just, boy, you know, what's gonna happen here? You, you really kinda kept hoping that, that he would see a strip and could land, but of course when we did go over our base, uh, when they, uh, through their method, knew we were coming, everything went dark. So there was no way for him to know that we were actually over our base, but he did an outstanding job pointing the plane in the right direction. And the only uh, bad thing was that P-38 coming up after us, but fortunately didn't get us. Uh, that would, would not have been the greatest way to end. But, you know, you, I, I can't say you're really fearful because um, you just know that um, eventually, I guess, there's going to be an outcome, whether you land or hopefully not have to bail out. But uh, it just everything just seemed to work mechanically toward that. Uh, and like I said, just before bailing out, all of a sudden I rec recalled everything from my training and um, what to do when you bail out. But the only thing I ignored is I didn't take a slow count to 10, which was fortunate. And um, now I don't know what happened uh, with my buddy that uh, caused him to hit. He may have delayed a little longer or something and hit stronger than I did and uh, broke his uh, leg bone down. And you talked about uh, uh, when you got down that road and those two guys in the truck were talking about this bomb dropped in Japan. Uh, how much longer, when did you realize the full extent of the atomic bomb and, and could you even fathom well, what the thought was? I, I couldn't fathom the atom bomb because I knew about, nothing about it, but I did know because I was doing a movie a documentary on our airstrip where they were making it bigger, uh, expanding the runways for some much larger bombers, which was the B-29 that was going to use our airstrip as a landing area. I didn't know what the connection was, but uh, yeah, like I say I did this documentary that uh, where the um, the Chinese uh, actually uh, built a heavier runway through a system of big rocks down to smaller ones, and um, it lengthened our runway out. And uh, like I say I had no idea what what all this was going to be because of course they wound up with these. Uh, B-25s, I believe it was, it took off from the aircraft carrier and went in into Japan and, and dropped their own bomb. They never made it back to the strip that we had prepared for them. I don't really remember where they wound up in China, but they did drop in there somewhere. Hmm. Over the years, did you, uh, have you kept in touch with your old buddy Stubby and, and such? Uh... Well, Stubby actually wound up staying in the service, went back to, I believe, Eglin Field in Florida, and uh, did on occasion communicate. He eventually developed cancer. He was a heavy smoker and died. But, uh, but one of the letters he sent me, he said he did uh, 
send a recommendation in for an award. And he said apparently nothing ever happened because he was an enlisted man and, and enlisted men could not make recommendations for, uh, for medals. But uh, whether this ultimately had any bearing on getting the Bronze Star eventually, I don't know. But uh, I, when I did get the Bronze Star, I kind of contested it because that was, uh, to me, a, an award they gave to people in the Army, not the Air Force. And I wrote in and, and asked if it shouldn't be changed to uh, you know, an Air Force medal. And they said, well, the fact that you were on the ground when you rescued him, you weren't in the airplane anymore. I didn't understand their ration, but I never, that was it. So yeah. that's the way that all wound up. Have you, uh, uh, after the war and, and up to this point, ever seen any of your work? I did. We went, uh, matter of fact, I was, uh, when I was still uh, working for Rexall in San Francisco, they had, a, uh, the 14th Air Force had a national deal in San Francisco. And of course the Chinese there went, went out really tremendous for this organization and uh, all, all types of uh, fancy Chinese foods like bird nest soup and that sort of stuff I remember. Um, and that was the only time that I can remember going to any, uh, any national convention. I just didn't get involved in that too much. I did stay in touch with a couple others that uh, some of them went, went to work at the studios in various deals, but at that time I was working for the magazine and I wasn't interested in following up there anymore. And uh, then I had no contact for several years until one of, uh, one of the fellows that I was in with was writing his memoirs and a story on the whole episode and so he wanted to know if I had any photographs excuse me, which I did, and I said, a matter of fact, he came out here and stayed with us at our place up in the mountains, and I uh, reviewed some photographs with him, and I don't know if he ever finished his book or not, but um, uh, there was one interesting episode coming back to mind there when I, I was um, on a ground mission, which was uh, down one portion of the Burma Road, I remember, and uh, I was going to do a story uh, of some bombed out areas and I pulled into a, um, a military base and uh, it was in the late afternoon, very late afternoon. I remember it was really hungry because we'd just been eating rations on the trip to this place. And I was driving the Jeep and I pulled up, I saw this GI standing beside the road and I said, uh, I need to find out whether there's a mess hall here. I'd like to get something to eat. And so he looks at me and he says, I tell you, Gil, if you just go down here a few blocks and turn left. And I did a quick take on him, and it turned out that he in turn was another gentleman that had gone through the photo class, but a couple of years ahead of me also. Huh. And he recognized me, and here he was there on a photo mission. And so we did, and we've stayed in touch, actually. Matter of fact, when I was on the police department, uh, I had bought a home out in San Fernando Valley, and I can remember back in my trailer trying to, to uh, get out of my driveway, unloading the furniture, and this fellow across the way was doing the same thing. We almost hit each other. We both get out of the cars to go up, and it turns out to be the same fellow that I met in China. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> and he was—he uh, had just gone on the fire department. So, like I say, we 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 stayed in contact down through the years, and and it was through him that I learned how to do the uh, rock work because he got involved in that out at the studios. And, So that's that's where all that wound up. Yeah. How do you how do you think or uh, that segment of your life, the, your war your war experience, how do you think that played into your your life or changed your life or affected your life? Did it uh, in any way or any well, thoughts that way? You know, the one ad advantageous thing was meeting my wife. You know, mm -hmm. through uh, through the situation, but. Um, 
When I went on the police department, another thing I had in mind was to get my formal education, which I did. I went, went to uh, uh, L.A. City College and USC and, and eventually... Uh, did you take advantage of the GI Bill? Yeah, that was on the GI Bill. Man, the interesting thing there, I, uh, at, at the end of the war there in, in China, they did give me a direct commission as a second lieutenant. And uh, so I was somewhat active in a uh, in a uh, in Air Force Reserve unit there in Hollywood. And one of the friends uh, on the police department said, "You know, if you join the National Guard, you get paid." And so that sounded good to me. So I I transferred out of the Air Force into the Army National Guard. And um, in the interim, the Korean thing broke out. I never collected one paycheck in our outfit. The 40th Infantry Division there in L.A. was activated. And so there I go again. <laughs> and uh, eventually wound up in Japan. But I didn't go on to Korea. I, I did get out with a, uh, with a hardship deal because of the size of my family. So fortunately I left before going back into mm. combat one uh, more time. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know, I, you know, like I say, it, I did get the advantage of the GI Bill, which I'm very appreciative of, and, uh, and did get several years of education on that. Um, of course, my major then was in police administration, which I, you know, never used again, but it still uh, broadened, you know, my viewpoint. And um, I don't know what would have happened if had there been no war. I really don't quite know where I would have wound up yeah. anything. Yeah. So yeah. it's difficult to look back and see if, like my wife says, the mistake I maybe made was uh, volunteering to go to China. If I'd have stayed at the studios, I probably would have wound up, you know, working for one of the studios. Mm -hmm. But the bad point there, I would have still been in Los Angeles, and from what I've seen that change down through the years, I have no desire to ever live there again. Well, as we wind down uh, this interview, is there anything you can think of that I didn't ask or you wanted to talk about, or any closing comments you'd like to make? No, actually, uh, uh, there's nothing further I can think of. I, like I say, I don't know if you're interested. I do have uh, some of the uh, things that the memorabilia that I had, uh, the, the uh, patch that I had to wear on my leather jacket in case. Yes, I'd like going to. Going down, I do have that hanging there. We'll photograph that. Yeah, yes. I have the uh, pilot shoot, the little pilot shoot. I, for some reason, I say that in the and the uh, shoot ring. And um, then I, I have one photograph that uh, I took of uh, General Chenault, which he autographed for me. And, and uh, of course, I thought very highly of, of both uh, General Chenault and his wife, and, and uh, very wonderful people. And basically, uh, oh, no, and then of course I've got the metal sanding down there too. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's photograph that. So very good. Okay, well, in closing, uh, it was a fascinating story. I, I appreciate you uh, sitting down to uh, to tell it, and more importantly, uh, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, I think you're doing a great job, and you should be congratulated too, Brad. Thank you. Yeah, this this. Uh, this one actually was, uh, as I recall, was worn on the back of my jacket, my leather jacket. And of course the idea here is that wherever you land at the various areas uh, or provinces there in China, someone may be able to read this and understand that you, you in fact, uh, you know, are an American and uh, so you should be considered a friendly. And it does ask to help and of course they would remunerate you if you had any expenses. This was worn on the inside of the jacket also. And uh, then you carried, you carried this with you, the identification with the official shop on it and all that sort of stuff in your photograph explaining who you are and, and uh, what your mission is. Matter of fact, the date on that, it's issued as uh, 9 December 1944. Even has an expiration date in 1945. I didn't realize that. Huh. And this was one uh, shot I took uh, 
because I was in a photographic unit of General Chenault and his staff where they were doing, uh, actually I think in this case some training in anticipation of bombing runs because we were right at the base which this is the base in the background here where the Japanese had come in and um, and had bombed and they, they caught the uh, fuel dumps that's why all the black smoke and of course the natives showing them with their excitement that particular photograph came back to the United States and and was run nationally in several different newspapers and then uh, this is my uh, ring that I had that I I saved that and uh, of course one of my dog tags there and uh, various letters this one is warding the purple heart and so forth and and then where I was reimbursed uh, where I had to pay the farmers to help me clear the field up on the mountaintop I just kind of kept that stuff and then the designation here of the four bars showed uh, each one was worth six months of foreign service, so I had two years over there. And then, like I said, I went in and eventually was a staff sergeant and was uh, in line to be the first sergeant of the organization when I had this uh, last mission. And uh, that was uh, changed because they gave me the gold bar there where I got the, um, the direct commission. And there's the air crew member wings, and there is um, the air medal, the bronze star, and the purple heart. These others are various campaign, uh, uh, I guess you could call them campaign ribbons for participating in various deals in the China, Burma, India patch, and in the uh, 14th Air Force Flying Tiger patch. And this actually a picture of me back then at that uh, early age at our base where I was based out of and then one of my sons got this uh, signed deal of the flying tigers of the uh, of the uh, various planes there the P-40s and the, eventually the 51s that come in and up here was our house boy Shorty and uh, that's me up there in effect trying to get them intoxicated <laughs> Seeing this picture reminds me again, I, I did see another high school friend, uh, again he was a couple of years older than I, that was flying P-40s, and I saw him there um, getting ready to go out on a mission, and and uh, so I said, well we got to get together when you get back. Well, unfortunately he never came back. Mm -hmm. And then up in the upper corner there? Yeah. This, this one? Uh, no, but, uh, above there? You're... Well, that's the uh, actual pilot chute, and that's uh, the, the first, it's all under tension, and that's what comes out of your chute first, pops open, catches some air, and that in turn pulls out your full parachute. So they just refer to it as the pilot chute. Very good.